Welcome to Politically Explained with the world's greatest host, Cronker Waltred. Thank you, intro video. You're too kind, although you're certainly not wrong. Tonight's top story, why private charity will never be able to solve poverty or hunger. What a cheery subject. Should be a good one. You see, back in 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson announced a war on poverty to finally end poverty once and for all in the world's richest country. And this war on poverty was off to a pretty good start, having reduced the rate of poverty from 20% to just over 10% in a decade. But by the 80s, the government had kind of gotten over that whole feeding the poor and solving poverty thing and had moved on to bigger and better things like giving humongo tax cuts to the rich. And even though it was dickhead Republican Ronnie Reagan who had abandoned the war on poverty, it was also dickhead Democrat Billy Clinton who effectively took a humongo hammer to our social safety net in his Welfare Reform Act of 1996, which Billy Clinton himself said effectively ended welfare because it put time limits on welfare, which meant that after only two years on welfare, the government could now tell you to get a job or to go die on the streets. And so, while Republicans and Democrats took turns dismantling the social safety net, well, the only thing around to really pick up the slack was private charities. So how are these private charities doing fighting the war on poverty? Well, not very well. You see, since the mid-70s, there hasn't been any real decrease in the poverty rate, which typically ranges from 10 to 15 percent. And when you include people who are close to living in poverty, well, then that number climbs all the way to 43.5 percent. And those figures are from before the COVID recession, so they're likely to be significantly higher now. And this failure to solve poverty isn't from a lack of charity. You see, since the 90s, there's been an explosion in the number of food banks. And the largest food bank network in the country, Feeding America, has seen a hundredfold increase in food distribution since the 70s. And yet, the percentage of children from food insecure homes has never dipped below 14%. Why? Why is it that LBJ's war on poverty managed to have the rate in a decade? Well, private charities with all their popularity haven't been able to make a dent. For starters, most charities focus on solving the immediate problem. For instance, a food bank will focus on feeding the hungry, but they won't necessarily focus on long-term strategies for getting those people they feed out of poverty. But there's also a more nefarious reason why private charities are unable to solve the root problem that they're tackling. You see, charities are extremely dependent on very generous donations from hyper-wealthy individuals and corporations. For instance, Walmart is the largest donor to food banks in the country. And they don't just do that because they have a good heart. You see, Walmart often will donate food that they would otherwise have to throw away because they couldn't sell. And in exchange, the government is happy to write them a nice tax write-off, and they get free good publicity. So in a way, these private charities are already part of our safety net since they get subsidized by the taxpayer via tax write-offs. Except instead of those tax dollars going directly to trying to deal with hunger and poverty like they had under the war on poverty, we now have those tax dollars going to large companies like Walmart in the form of charitable tax deductions, simply for giving away food that they otherwise would have thrown away. And it's not just on the supply side that charities are dependent on corporations. You see, almost 22% of food bank board members work for a Fortune 1000 company, compared to only 0.08% that are affiliated with labor unions. And charities often spend millions on executive salaries while relying on thousands of unpaid volunteers or low-income workers. So a lot of charities are dependent on big corporations for their supply side, and a lot of them have corporate leadership, so what? Well, it turns out that has a pretty serious impact on how they can tackle the issues that they're supposedly fighting. Because you might think that charities that fight hunger, for instance, would support ending starvation wages and raising the minimum wage. And yet, very few do, and it's not because they don't believe such a thing would help. 
Joyce Rothermel, former CEO of the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, wanted her food bank to support a living wage ordinance. But she refrained from even bringing it to her board because she knew that members who represented the business community would shoot it down. And she's not alone. Gloria McAdams, former CEO of Food Chair in Hartford, Connecticut, says that it's an easy sell to this board to be doing SNAP outreach or advocacy on SNAP, but it's more challenging to convince them that we should work on health care and minimum wage, and that if she were too out there on a living wage, she would get backlash. SNAP, if you're not familiar, is a food stamp program. But why is that? Why is it that corporations are okay with food banks advocating for certain government programs like SNAP for food stamps, but aren't as happy with them advocating for raising the minimum wage or expanding health care rights? Well, because SNAP actually benefits these humongo retailers that are such a large part of the food bank ecosystem. Walmart, for instance, which is now the biggest donor to food banks, gets about 4% of its total revenue from food stamps. And they're one of the four largest employers of food stamp recipients. So supporting SNAP actually makes Walmart money, both in direct revenue and in the savings of not having to pay their workers a living wage whereas raising the minimum wage would make them have to actually pay their workers a decent wage. So basically, food banks are allowed to advocate for government policies that would allow their large donors to profiteer off of, but not ones that would actually cost their large donors money. And it just so happens that that's often the difference between supporting policies that might actually lift people out of poverty, like raising the minimum wage, and supporting policies that keep people in poverty, but subsidize that poverty so that even poor people can afford to shop at Walmart, including Walmart employees who are often on government assistance like SNAP. But I suppose that the real lesson to all of this is that private charity, while kind and noble, ultimately manages crises, but it can't resolve those crises on their own. And that like so many things in our society, the wealthy use it to expand their own self-interest and profiteer off of what's supposed to be selfless work advocating only for the parts of the safety net that benefit them and wanting to gut the rest. But perhaps the worst in all of this is that we actually do know how to fight poverty. We've done it before, but we gave up over a generation ago. The political establishment gave up on the dream of an America without hunger in order to give even more to those whose hunger knows no bounds. And private charity has helped curve the losses in our social safety net. But it's time for us to stop holding the line and finish out what we set to do in 1964 and end poverty in this country once and for all. And yes, that will mean more government spending, or rather a redirection in government spending so that we spend more on job training and education and affordable housing as opposed to trillion dollar tax cuts for the hyper wealthy and corporations. Alright, that's the end of the episode. I, I know, I know, I'm sad too, but that's why you should like and subscribe so you can come see me again sometime. Next time we'll be talking about neoliberalism and why you hate your life. Turns out they're pretty related. Who knew? Alright, I hope you learned a bit about private charity and the war on poverty. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to go take a poop. <laughs>